Welcome to Inside Grand Prix and to the Formula One premiere in India. Coming up, a guessing game with Inside Grand Prix. Who am I? Plus, it's decided many a race. Strategy. First, more circuit info with world champion Sebastian Vettel. Namaste from the Put International Circuit in India. 40 kilometers from New Delhi. Three sectors, 16 turns, four slow turns, three high-speed stretches. An up and downhill track with up to 8% downward slopes and 10% inclines. A real roller coaster ride. Circuit length 5.14 kilometers. 60 laps clockwise. 308 kilometers race distance. The setup is especially complicated here. Maximum downforce for extremely slow turns and minimum drag for the fast parts. Up to 20 meters track width, so lots of space and good spots for overtaking on one of the fastest tracks. Let's do a lap. Full throttle, curse on, catch a good position for turn one, the first chance to overtake. Brake late but hard, down into second gear. Back on power, slightly uphill towards turn three. At 80, the slowest turn on the circuit. And accelerate hard for the longest straight. Rear wing open, slipstream all in. With 320 top speeds down into a slight dip. Immediately uphill again into turn four. From 320 down to 100. Without locking up a front wheel. Into sector two. Five quick turns, a real slalom that needs lots of rhythm and precision. Theoretically, there's room for several cars next to each other here. Despite the wide track, it sometimes can get cramped. Uphill again, almost flying blind into turn 10. A long drawn out 215 degree loop with several apexes. Avoid much braking action, keeping the speed up at about 200. Downhill into the last sector, quick and tricky. Turn 14, the track is again seductively wide, but still not enough room for risky maneuvers. Turn 16, the last one. Downhill race with hard braking from 260 down to 100. Foot International Circuit, an unusual track peppered with difficult spots and fantastic chicanes. India, that's going to be a tough race which really challenges us drivers. Can't wait. And so to the latest standings. It's only about the Vice Championship now. Jensen Button has the best chances, followed by Alonso. Congratulations for the Constructors' Championship, Red Bull Racing. McLaren, Mercedes and Ferrari are fighting for second place. Since Japan, we've already had this year's world champion. But there's another hot trophy to get, the DHL Fastest Lap Trophy. Well, as you know, speed is one of the big attributes of using DHL. And we thought that speed and consistency is something that represents the DHL brand name. So finding the driver who over a whole season consistently got the number one fastest time the most should get something a little bit special. So far on the top of the list, Red Bull driver Mark Webber. Only Hamilton and Button could beat him. And now, Namaste and welcome to Boom Nation India. Opinions differ on India. It's without doubt one of the economic centers of the future. 1.2 billion people, of which two-thirds are of working age, a great many of them very well educated. Those are economically sensational prospects for the world's largest democracy. The demographics are in India by far one of the most positive uh, influences right now and also going forward. 
India will have the youngest um, population up to the year 2050, the largest working age population. In economic terms, that means a population between the ages of 15 and 64. And we will be, uh, in India, the largest working age population of, all country, of any country in the world. India's flip side is shocking. 400 million people living in absolute poverty, the untouchables. By caste and birth, social advancement has denied them for life. By contrast, the middle class in consumer demand is exploding. Welcome to India, Formula One. I think it's, it's great for the country. I think we, you know, there's good interest in the sport in India. I think there's a lot of people who are uh, followers of Formula One on television. If we can get them to come to the race in October, that'll be fantastic. Um, you know, the media has been very friendly and very supportive so far. So we'll see. We we'll keep pushing the sport and we'll see what happens. No country is dirtier, no nation more glittering. None has to live with so many prejudices and so many true and made up myths. Incredible India is the country's slogan. More fitting would be unpredictable India. The thing you can't imagine about India is the volume of the mass of people there, and the smells too, of course, also take a bit of getting used to. You certainly get the odd fragrance that wafts up into your nose that you've not smelled before, and that you also don't necessarily find pleasant. But there's a very special vibe there, a special spirituality, including in everyday life, in totally normal everyday life. India is a booming country. The best example of this, the new Formula One site, the new Okla Industrial Development Area, Noida for short. Originally planned as a business district on the periphery of Delhi, now another of India's mushrooming suburbs. As of Indian I think we're all looking forward to India. It'll be fantastic and a great experience to see the country for the first time. Hopefully lots of fans will turn out too. The circuit's bound to be great, as Herman Tilke's building it and he normally always creates great circuits. Formula One is remaining true to its tradition. Where it goes, that's where there's growth. India. The new face in the Formula One family. A beautiful, yet also sad countenance. One that polarizes opinion. Incredible, unpredictable India. The market of the future. And now, nothing beats being at home. Indians in Formula One. Nareen Kartikeyan, Karun Chantok, Vijay Malia. Three men, three faces, one goal. Uh, well, what can I say? I would love to win the Indian Grand Prix. Words that leave no room for doubt. As the first Indian racing driver in Formula One, Karthik Ayan achieved his dream in 2005. After his year with Jordan, he was self-assured. First, my dream was to become uh, India's first Formula One driver. I achieved this now. Now it's to probably get on the podium and win a race. The following year, he moved to Williams, where he was fourth driver alongside Alexander Wurtz. Kathikeyan nevertheless saw his switch to second string as progress. I thought it's better to drive for a front-running team uh, rather than, you know, drive for somebody who was always at the back. Then came a gap. Not until four years later did he return to Formula One, going in search of points with HRT. After this year's European Grand Prix, it was the exit again. In India, he's back behind the wheel with big ambitions to finish in front of Lotus and Marussia Virgin. Up-and-coming Karen Chandhok made his debut as test driver at Red Bull in 2007. The youngest Indian in the Formula One camp quickly impressed with his talent. In 2010 came his chance at HRT. For the first half of the season, he drove with Bruno Senna for the Spanish team. Then followed a move to Team Lotus. As test driver, he went flat out and gained valuable experience. The team teaching a little lesson to Trulli gave him an unexpected opportunity. A perplexed Jano Trulli left Chantok a vacant cockpit, an opportunity, however, not fully taken. At the end of the day, it's all about taking the opportunities that you have, you know, and for me, this was an opportunity to, to work and learn with a better team and to, uh, to hopefully further my career in the long term. 
Several years before, the Indian billionaire had already stepped ostentatiously onto the glittering stage of Formula One. Whatever this man touches seems to automatically turn to gold. I started off sponsoring the Benetton Formula One team uh, in 95 uh, when Flavio Briatore was team principal and when uh, Michael Schumacher was actually driving. Uh, I then followed up with the sponsorship of the uh, Panasonic Toyota racing team before I bought what was Spiker, now Force India. Malia needs Formula One and Formula One needs Malia. Guests at his parties are regularly a who's who of the racing scene. And he skillfully uses the glitz and glamour in Formula One for his own purposes. VJ Malia flaunts what he's got. On his glittering appearances, he shows his personality and cleverly promotes his Kingfisher brand. You know, I've had uh, my own private uh, plane since 1988 and I've had uh, my own yachts since 1992. So this is nothing new for me. Um, and um, I use my planes as well as my yachts for entertaining my business customers, my partners, as well as for my personal pleasure. His United Breweries empire includes an airline and is the leader in the Indian beer and spirits market. Malia has built Kingfisher up into a global lifestyle brand. I rose in the company from the bottom. I, I started off as a trainee and with strict instructions given to management that I should be treated as an external junior employee and not as the boss's son. And, um, well, you know, that's how life started. You know, I, I complained a lot. <laughs> Today, he can no longer complain. But will Malia's wish be fulfilled this year? What a show that would be, a Force India driver getting onto the podium at the first home Grand Prix. And now, often what tilts the balance, the perfect race strategy. Committed, crafty, clever, those are Vettel attributes. Winning his second title confirms this. However, the glory is far from down to him alone. Formula One is a team sport. And this team sport is all about tactics. Tweaking, cogitating, pondering. From Red Bull to McLaren to Lotus, everyone looks for the perfect strategy. Sometimes during Formula One races, there can be long periods where there's just little track action and no overtaking. In those times, the race strategy can just be absolutely crucial. Strategy is the understanding of the fuel that's in the car, the tyres and how they're working, the track. The track is never static, it is always changing, it's always dynamic in terms of its grip that it's giving you, it's the performance of the tyres and how it's working. Putting that all together, we use a number of complex simulations, so computer systems, that work with us during the race. But ultimately, it's a human decision at the end, and it has to be. It's all about psychologically having the upper edge against your rivals. Mainly the strategy is decided by the team because they just have a much better overview of the whole situation on the television, on their computers. Each Formula One team has its chief strategist and they've been whacking their brains this year, especially due to the Pirelli tires. A good lap in qualifying says nothing about whether the car and tires are in harmony. It's only during the race that the strategists can tell how well they suit each other. Strategy doesn't just extend to the race, it also extends to qualifying and prior to that. The most important thing is approaching the race weekend with a clear and concise plan for the drivers. In qualifying the strategy is understanding what tyres will do, how to use them, in what order, and how to apply that for the final result in the final qualifying session. And in the race, it's the decisions about when we're stopping, who we are racing against, who are our primary competitors, and how we're going to beat them on track. It's a bit like playing chess. Uh, it's a group of clever people in our team 
against a group of clever people in the other team and you just always want to be a few steps ahead of them to be able to beat them. Race strategy in its most simplest form is achieving the highest possible result at the end of the race. And that may mean you're beating cars that are faster than you on track or have better pit stops than you, but you're achieving it through outwitting them. Box, box, pit confirmed. Strategy, the art of doing the right things at the right time. And with the right strategy, you create success. We're taking a short break, then it's our guessing game. Plus, with our air freight, there'd be no Formula One. We look back to the early days. Don't go away. Hi, I'm Nico Rosberg, Formula One driver for Mercedes GP Petronas. Head and neck trauma remain one of the worst single injuries that we can experience as Formula One drivers. As a result, um, the helmets have been developed extremely lightly in recent years. Um, and you can just feel, I mean, now it's like 1,200 or 1,300 grams and that's, that's just amazing considering that they, all the things that they put in here, the carbon, the visor and all the rest of it. We experience extreme g-forces in cornering, so already for, for my neck muscles that's a big help. But not only that, it helps extremely in the case of an accident. Um, because in, in the accidents we can get whiplash sort of injuries, where the head just smacks over or something, and the helmet being lighter really reduces our injuries severely. On a motorbike, you run the risk of similar head and neck injuries as us Formula One drivers. So please take one advice to heart. Wearing a helmet reduces the risk of serious injuries by up to 90%. Welcome back to Inside Grand Prix. Coming up, the latest news from the Formula One scene. But first, take a guess, who am I? I'm 1.8 meters tall. The village that I live in lies in a valley. I drive quickly and safely. All my ex-girlfriends were blondes. So do you know who this is? Hello. Hi, my name is Bernd Meilander and I'm the official Formula One safety car driver. Unchallenged for 15 years, unbeaten for 15 years, the Mercedes brand achieving all its dreams. Manicur in 1996 was, as it were, Mercedes-Benz's first outing as the safety car in Formula One. And for that they used the car that I used to drive. It had been given a couple of lights on top and bucket seats inside, but that was ultimately it. The only person who's never yet been overtaken on a Formula One circuit. Top speed, 317 kilometers per hour. For his Formula One colleagues, generally too slow. For years, he's therefore repeatedly been asked one question. Couldn't that have gone faster? I then always say, you need to speak to Norbert Haug about that. But the difference between a Formula One car and the safety car is simply so enormously big. And you also just don't see on TV how fast the safety car's actually going. The safety car, a symbol of reliability. Not a single did not finish in 15 years. But what if the unthinkable were to happen? Worst case, not too Worst case of course, I'm not quite sure whether I'd personally go back to the paddock or disappear straight off to the hotel. The procedure carries on though if the safety car is then stuck somewhere in gravel or even worse if I've been bumped into somewhere. A second safety car would then go out onto the track. We have two cars you see on site. 24 drivers fight at each Grand Prix for every meter. Bert Mailander, however, does not. He's condemned to watch, like a spare part, the 25th man in the Formula One squad. 
Uh, ich fühle mich nicht als 25. Fahrer persönlich. Personally, I don't feel like a 25th driver. I go out now and then onto the track when things get hot, when some things happen, which fortunately is not that often. The best races, by the way, are when I've got nothing to do. But yes, clearly, I'm a part of the race event. Everybody accepts what I do or follows the instructions of the safety car, and therefore I find it fun. But I'm not a spare part either. When you've been in motorsport for 11 years, then these 11 years of Formula One naturally leave their mark. 1.8 meters tall. From the south of Germany. Bernd Mailander. Safety car driver in Formula One. And now, logistics and Formula One in India. India is an emotive land. Daniel Ricciardo got an early taste of this with Red Bull at a show run in New Delhi and won lots of fans. The subcontinent at full throttle, but that's the recent past. Eight decades before a certain Raymond Sommer became keen on motorsport. One fine day, Raymond got interested in cars. Cars were his great passion and he was determined to become a racing driver. His father saw this and, as he knew he couldn't accommodate him in the family business anymore, he bought him a car, an American one. And it was with that car that Raymond started racing. Then he bought one for himself, not an American, a European one, from the various Italian makes he chose Alfa Romeo. He raced in a Ferrari too. In fact, he was the first ever Ferrari racing driver. He also took part in the 24 Hours of Le Mans, which he incidentally won twice in succession, in 1932 and 1933. At the Belgian Grand Prix in 1950, Formula One's first year, Raymond took on a superior rival, Alfa Romeo. Sensationally, Sommer stayed in contention, until a mechanical fault forced him to retire his Talpo early. Courage to take risks was in his blood. Sommer's father had also gained fame. He built the biplane, that a hundred years ago made the first airmail flight ever. The occasion was the World Postal Service exhibition in Allahabad. It was the first official airmail plane. It carried 6,000 letters, a distance of 16 kilometers to Allahabad. We've uh, incidentally got an example of one of the envelopes that were carried and distributed in India. For the 8km flight to Naini, the plane carrying pilot Henri Pequet took 13 minutes. That's equivalent to around 8.5 laps or over 40 kilometers on the Boot International Circuit. However, Vettel and Co. have around 800 horsepower at their disposal. The Sommel biplane was powered by no more than a 50 horsepower engine. After long and thorough planning, Formula One is now all set to fly in low and make a precision landing in India. One year before the Indian Grand Prix, the DHL team started to have a dialogue with the local authorities. As Formula One's logistics partner, we need to provide an agreement with customs to handle the customs operation in our systems as quickly as possible, to temporarily import the equipment and to deliver it on time to the circuit. On Roger Sommer's airmail flight, it was all of 150 kilograms. Today, it's 40 tons per team, so nothing can be left to chance. Obviously, DHL is well prepared because uh, they do have a structure in India. However, the Formula One demands on the racetrack are uh, somewhat special and that means that the DHL, the local team um, at the event uh, is very very busy in creating all the necessary steps that once the race arrives, all the, all the pieces, all the cars, all the equipment uh, arrives that you know it goes in no time through customs and is delivered to the racetrack otherwise no racing. The foundations were laid through pioneering spirit a century ago 
Roger and Raymond Sommer were true high flyers long before there was modern logistics and Formula One. Just ahead of the race on Sunday, now our latest news. 2011 is definitely the year of Red Bull. First premature title for Vettel and now premature win of the Constructors' Championship. Red Bull Racing pocket 10 million euros for being on top of the list. As a team, we've just gained strength. We've learned from last year. We've applied those lessons well and uh, we've maximized our chances so far. For the world champion, the first place in South Korea is also his 20th Grand Prix victory. He now has as many race wins as Mika Hakkinen. On October the 22nd, Sebi celebrated his second title at home at Heppenheim. And his car, Kinky Kylie, was with him, of course. 30,000 fans came to welcome the youngest double world champion. A new record. The world champions have become the first race team to do a show run at the highest point on earth accessible by car. Kadungla, a mountain pass in the Himalayan region of northwest India. This special show run at over 5,600 meters in minus 11 degrees took a year to plan, involving over 3,000 hours of work and expenditure of 200,000 US dollars. Freezing at the wheel of the Red Bull was Swiss driver Neil Janney, later duly warmed up by his team. Well done, Neil. You've just broken the world record for the highest ever F1 car drive. India rocks, a weekend of premieres, the first Formula One Grand Prix in India and F1 rocks in India for the first time too. Star acts like David Guetta and Jamira Kwai have already sent Formula One fans wild at the concerts alongside Formula One racers. This time in India, hard rockers Metallica top the bill. Organizers anticipate over 30,000 party mad fans. Now to the hardest breaking point on the Buddha International Circuit. For the Brembo engineers, it's ahead of the third corner where the cars decelerate by a full 225 kilometers per hour. The power dispersed in doing so is 2,392 kilowatts. The drivers are exposed to a mighty 5.59 G and have to press with 145 kilograms onto the brake. That was Inside Grand Prix for today. We'll see you again in Abu Dhabi. But for now, enjoy the race in India.